to uh, give this uh, short talk to you. Um, and I gather there's all sorts of different people from different backgrounds in the audience, uh, some with more technical or specialist knowledge and some uh, more general. So we try and pitch this uh, in the right uh, at the right level and we can sort of pull out any more kind of detail um, at the end in terms of questions. Now, Owen, I hopefully you, you're seeing the screen yeah, I've got that, John. presentation OK. And, and Dan, please do chip in. Uh, otherwise, uh, I think you're going to uh, give a few words towards the end of the, this initial presentation. So really, yes, the, the sort of the subjects of this talk really is, is the future of residential heating. And as, as Owen has um, ably sort of outlined earlier, is one of the reasons for this, one of not the, the only reason, but the, the primary reason is to do with reducing our carbon emissions, um, and we've, we need to tackle heating as a key part of that. And this is really giving you some background to the Some People Project, which was uh, a European project that's coming to an end very soon. We've been spending a couple of years working on this with the City Council, Plymouth Energy Community from Plymouth, but also two organisations based in Brittany uh, called Alloen or Ezio. So go on to the next slide. Sorry. So, yeah, the Some People Project finishes in August and it's really about the decarbonisation of heat um, through uh, which is one of the biggest energy uses in the UK. And uh, it's really focusing on the use of solar and heat pumps. So to do with uh, electrification of heat, but also uh, use of solar PV or solar thermal, which we we'll go into in a bit more detail. So in terms of. The national context and the um, the kind of chart that you can see at the top uh, right shows in pink the emissions related to buildings, which are around 31 percent. So a very significant, um, quite similar to transport. But within that, you can see that heat specifically around the energy used in buildings is a significant part of the overall carbon emissions around 23%. So it's something that's, there's been a lot of focus around decarbonizing electricity. You used to talk about solar farms uh, and winds, turbines, et cetera, and the same with transport, but heat is, is probably one of those areas which, um, you know, the government's still grappling with, uh, hope, hopefully getting a clearer vision about that. Uh, and it is more complicated because Every building's different, and uh, every building owner is different, or occupant is different. But we've got the clear message here is to, to reach net zero carbon by 2050, which we're legally signed up to achieve. Uh, the Climate Change Committee sets out that just, we, we need to completely decarbonize this sector. And the challenge we have at the moment is, is that 80% of our homes um, of the heat for our homes is produced from natural gas. Now, at the national level, the government's, uh, we gather, has written the heat and building strategy, I think back in March this year, and we're supposed to uh, due to publish it in, in June this year, but uh, obviously June's passed, uh, we're still waiting for it, but hopefully that will give more detail about how, from a national perspective, um, the role of different technologies and how the government sees this rolling out. So from a more Plymouth specific level, uh, Plymouth City Council declared a climate emergency uh, and made a pledge as part of that with other partner organisations in the city, uh, some key stakeholders to be carbon neutral by 2030, which is a challenging um, target. Uh, ambitious, but uh, sees the necessity to to try and take early action and not necessarily wait to 2050. Um, so, and and the chart below shows on a local level the range of uh, you know where emissions are in terms of of, of Plymouth and 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 buildings still come out tops uh, at 31 percent. But clearly, we need to heat's one of those things on a local level as well as national level that we need to 
uh, understand how we uh, un uh, move away from fossil fuels primarily. And um, and in terms of the emissions forecasts, if we if we if we don't, uh, you know, this is this is some work that was done as part of the climate emergency in Plymouth. If we continue as business as usual and don't take steps to decarbonize, then uh, carbon emissions will rise in Plymouth. Um, if we take all, you know, follow the national um, policies that we hope uh, will be introduced or are, we know that are coming in uh, to do with new development primarily, but um, hopefully for retrofit as well, then that still leaves a policy gap if we're going to achieve um, being carbon neutral by 2030. So effectively what that means uh, would be by 2030 that all our city's heat and power would have to come from renewable low carbon sources uh, that might be within the city or outside of the city and all our buildings need to maximize the energy efficiency so in terms of the thermal reduce the heat demand where possible look at thermal improvements that might include insulation glazing uh, or, or more efficient uh, use of that energy within the buildings uh, that's not to say that transport and you know, uh, biodiversity are not important, but obviously the focus here is around heat. And and really, what does that mean in practice? So the University of Exeter did some work for Plymouth City Council uh, a year or so back, uh, looking at the sort of levels of the sorts of interventions that might be needed. And you can see compared to the the, the current deployment rate, which is probably gone up a little bit actually but um, the required deployment rate is significantly higher which shows the scale of the challenge we're dealing with and obviously this picks up some of the interventions being heat pumps um, which I'll come on to and explain a little bit more about them things like loft insulation cavity wall insulation to give two examples this isn't a new thing uh, you know in the last um, 50 years or 60 years, we've seen quite significant changes in the way we heat buildings. Um, and, you know, the drivers for that, not necessarily carbon, but they may have been clean air, uh, originating with the Clean Air Acts that many of you be familiar with, which have changed, been a whole series of, since 1956, a whole series uh, right up into 2020. And this is to do with, uh, you know, smokeless zones, reducing the, um, you know, from a position where houses were primarily heated by uh, sources such as coal with individual fires within each room and then moving to electric bar heaters in each room. Um, so we have seen significant change already. And so change is nothing new to the way that we heat buildings. But it's also worth bearing in mind that although we may not see smoke uh, or air pollution from burning gas through gas boilers, gas boilers actually contribute a very significant amount to poor air, air quality, um, in many cases as much as traffic, but we just don't see this pollutant, it's uh, NOx emissions. So it's something definitely to bear in mind. And in some cases that's caused problems with, with new gas boilers as well. And the way that we've distributed heat within buildings has uh, changed massively as well uh, with the rise of central heating from 1970 around 30% of homes using uh, central heating to uh, getting up to sort of 90% by um, by sort of uh, beginning of this current decade. So uh, there have been significant changes and it's worth bearing that in mind in terms of the changes that may need to come yet. So um, let's get back again, sorry. So in terms of options, what are the options that we have to decarbonize heat? And there's a lot of uh, debate uh, nationally and, and researchers looking at this issue. And, and I know the government's been looking at uh, government department bays whose responsibility this lies within primarily 
uh, has been evaluating a whole series, as have many uh, city cities throughout the UK um, individually have been looking at this issue, is, is what are the options? And the most obvious one, uh, and the one that the Climate Change Committee has focused on, for the, particularly for the residential sector, so uh, it is around heat pumps. Heat pumps are a, a mature technology. I'll come on to that in a minute. And uh, they, they have some challenges, which we'll also come on to. But electrification of heat is obviously going to be uh, through heat pumps and through uh, solar are going to be a key component of decarbonisation. There's been a lot of talk about hydrogen, which we'll also come on to, uh, which has its own challenges. Um, but will play a part in particularly industrial processes and, and transportation, etc. But there's, it, it's, let's not forget other sources of heat that can also play a role. And solar thermal, or another variant of that, solar thermodynamic, uh, it still is a good source of heat, of high grade heat. Uh, doesn't cost anything uh, to, to generate that heat once the installation has been done. Uh, although solar, solar thermodynamic is used, used a small heat pump, there's also heat sources which will form part of the overall strategy for heat uh, and have done, particularly in rural areas, biomass to some degree, waste heat sources, maybe from industry um, or for uh, from uh, waste processing and district energy, which is really a, a, a me method of sharing heat and cooling between buildings, including use of waste heat. Um, where there's high urban density. What we're, we're not really talking about here is direct electric boilers or individual electric radiators um, for reasons that I come on to, which is, is, you know, that has a similar carbon content to gas very often based on current grid electricity, but it also uses up a lot of grid capacity, which we'll need in the future. So obviously improving the performance of our buildings will be important to decarbonize heat. So it's not to, um, although that's, this is not the, the main subject of this talk, um, that still remains a challenge and something that the governments are keen to address. And uh, the government's keen to, to raise properties to EPC to an energy performance certificate rating of C. And you can see from the chart there that many buildings don't uh, um, are below this rating. So there's a big challenge here to improve the thermal performance through insulation, uh, through glazing, through loft insulation, etc. Uh, we're look at, looking really around 17 million properties out of the UK's uh, 27 million homes between now and 2050. But we need to make some real progress in this before 2035, where that's possible. Uh, if, if possible, uh, the, the fabric of the building should be improved before introducing low carbon heat. That's not always possible. There are some challenging buildings, some listed buildings, for example, where um, a deep retrofit isn't possible. But it may be possible to, to, to do all of this in one go. Um, but that depends on, on sort of national support. So hydrogen, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen. The Climate Change Committee's view, who the advisory body to the government on, on you know, how to achieve the targets, uh, suggests it's going to play a very important role, particularly in heavy industry and uh, heavy traffic transport like um, shipping, for example. And it will definitely play its part. Uh, it, there may be a role for hydrogen in terms of domestic as well, to some degree. But uh, really, hydrogen is still at the R&D stage. They're trialing different prototype boilers, which could be used um, in various domestic residential examples. But it's not the sort of Hydrogen is not something that you can just readily uh, pipe into existing heat mains. It's, it's a lot leakier than natural gas is at the moment. And so the verdict's out as to whether it could be used to significantly decarbonize the gas grid. 
I think the feeling generally is that it could be used more locally in areas, but not uh, to retain your gas boilers in most cases and uh, supplant with hydrogen. So the main emphasis, certainly for um, domestic, I apologise for this darting around, is the electrification of heat. And uh, really, uh, th that's really referring to heat pumps primarily as the main technology. So the Climate Change Committee is suggesting that we need to reach installation of a million heat pumps a year by 2030, which is not that far off. Um, and Bayes, the government department Bayes, are suggesting that there's minimum market capacity for 600,000 heat pumps per year. So if you imagine they're currently saying that we're installing 30,000 per year at the moment, that needs a big step change uh, to roll out heat pumps. So though I think we also need to compare with the early days of solar and understand how that's been rolled out to become a mainstream technology from what was really quite marginal when it began through various supports. And uh, so really, what is, a, what is a heat pump? Um, there's an image of one of my neighbor's heat pumps um, in the top right. And uh, I think estimations are around 140 million heat pumps working in the world. Um, but they are an old technology. So they're originally conceived by Lord Kelvin back in 1852. Um, and the first heat pump was built in 1856. So we're not talking about a new technology, it's a proven technology. Um, there's still a lot of advances in the supply chain, but really most people have got at least two heat pumps in their home. They've got a fridge and a freezer. That's basically a heat pump, but it's working in cooling mode rather than heating mode. You can get some heat pumps that will provide cooling as well as heating. Uh, reversible heat pumps, but we're not going. We won't go into those right now. So heat pumps. The reason why they're important for decarbonisation is they can use a small amount of electricity to generate. Typically, depending on the house, three or four times the amount of heat. Now uh, they, they use a compressor to change the nature of the. Um, the heat source uh, from a, a gas, um, so it changed the characteristics and then basically will step up the amount of heat. Um, so the compressor is a key part of the, the overall heat pump des design. Um, the example you can see in the photograph is an air source heat pump, which tend to work quite well in the southwest where you've got a milder climate. So to get to higher temperatures, they're more efficient. So electricity has a lower carbon content than gas at the moment, and with plans to decarbonise that further through uh, offshore wind, a big, uh, large push for offshore wind, as an example, then, you know, the use of heat pumps, if they're using uh, a third of the, uh, therefore we'll probably have a third of the carbon that compared to gas, and that will decrease over time, if that makes sense. So uh, through the Some People project, we've done feasibilities on a variety of different sites, different buildings, but, you know, uh, domestic examples. But also we looked at some commercial buildings, some office and civic buildings and some listed buildings to see how you would introduce heat pumps and what you can do. And um, really, this is just a sort of a, 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 an overview about some of the things that we've learned from looking at that. Just lost your sound, I think, um, John. Owen. Ah, back again. How much did you miss? Um, probably about... 15, 20 seconds, I think. Oh, OK. All right. Which uh, can you um, point me to which slide? Um, um, probably 
if we go on to the one we're on you're showing now i think um okay okay i apologize for that it sort of tends to dip in and out sometimes um so there's a number of different things when you're retrofitting so if it's a new build and roll out of heat pumps with new build it's a lot more straightforward and with new uh higher um more energy efficient buildings which should be delivered um through new build heat pumps should be a much easier proposition with retrofit obviously it depends on the building characteristics and the number of things you need to think about this is not intended to be exhaustive but just a kind of an overview of, of, of some of the things that we've learnt from looking up a number of different types of buildings so the sort of typical questions are do i need to insulate before you move to a low carbon heating system um, not always but you will achieve a higher efficiency and therefore um, by reducing the heating demand and operating at a lower heating temperature and that has a knock-on effect in terms of the cost of running uh, a heat pump in particular but you will achieve if the object is to achieve carbon savings then uh, that's this can give a, a, a kind of lower life cycle cost than if you're looking at a whole house retrofit so the simple answer is ideally you would look at measures to, re to reduce the heat demand through glazing performance secondary glazing we'd be looking at in some listed buildings for example uh, and even that can make some difference or insulation uh, where that's possible internal wall or external wall or loft insulation for example that can help to make a heat pump work more efficiently and may may mean that you can even with your existing heating system central heating if you've got central heating so um, the other thing is obviously using a very high um, very high value fuel like like gas means that we've tended to be um, spoilt in the past and you notice that the heating temperatures uh, that you have that the boiler set at is usually a quite high at 80 degrees very often it doesn't need to be at 80 degrees you can ratchet down your your temperature um, and maybe you can try this at home and still feel the same comfort levels so actually we're probably wasting more energy uh, with our because we've, we've been spoiled in the past we've not had to consider the use of, of gas because it's been very cheap in the UK um, but um, so you can do things like uh, reduce the operating temperature of your central heating if you've got central heating at the moment and that can help but also things like glazing um, you can re you know reducing your heating temperature to 70 degrees for example could accommodate an air source heat pump uh, and things like draft proofing insulating void spaces that can all help um, reduce your heating demand and increase the cut levels of comfort so you might want to try that at home the other thing about the heat pump is you do need some some space depending on the type of heat pump which we come into but for a lot of people it's going to be looking at um, a an air source heat pump uh, but you do need some external space to put the air source heat pump um, and you may in some cases need space for things like buffer tanks um, or you know domestic hot water tanks if you've got an existing uh, gas combi boiler and you're moving over to a heat pump uh, you might need to, to think about those and what is possible it could be that the heat pump could be on top of a flat roof for example um, it can create but I think yes you need to think about the space characteristics now there are lots of different types of heat pump um, as well as air source there are ground source or water source now in most cases unless you're you know it's a housing association or it's a group of properties owned by the same owner it is most likely to be air source um, but there is the potential to share um, 
other sources between buildings in particular, which can offset the kind of investment that's needed. Water source tends to be more efficient than air source, but air source is still works pretty well in the southwest with its mild climate. You also need to think about the electricity capacity uh, in your building. Um, I think in most cases with domestic, it's less likely to be an issue, but cumulatively, all these heat pumps installations will, will add an extra load that Western Power needs to uh, factor into its forward thinking. So those are the kind of key issues. I mean, it's also worth saying that heat pumps can generate uh, some noise. Some heat pumps, if you imagine your fridge or freezer, they, they kind of hum away in the corner of your kitchen. You don't probably don't notice them, but some heat pump designs are quieter than others. Uh, they can do design features uh, which um, reduce this in terms of the fan design, the fan size, which reduce the noise levels. And so it is worth checking that out um, to ensure you get a quiet a, a unit that works in your space. So, so yeah, in terms of heat pumps, one of the, there are some challenges, particularly in terms of costs. Um, gas is very cheap in the UK compared to electricity. Um, so uh, even though uh, you know it might use one unit of electricity to generate uh, three units of heat, which might be not too dissimilar from gas. Um, that does create or can create a, a, a revenue pressure um, if it's not thought through very carefully. Um, electricity has all the taxation, it has 15% taxation, whereas gas has very little uh, taxation on it. Uh, so that does put electricity at a disadvantage. Um, and that's maybe something that the government needs to think about nationally in terms of how, how does it redress that balance and make uh, to encourage heat pumps to be rolled out. The other key challenge is that uh, at the moment, similar to solar in the early days, heat pumps have higher capital costs for installation compared to gas boilers. Gas boilers have very big supply chains um, and, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, have reduced their costs. They, they are quite cheap. Heat pumps are still um, not as big a market as gas boilers and uh, have higher capital costs. Maybe those costs will come down with greater deployment. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm sure they will do. Uh, they may still be slightly higher than gas boilers because there's more equipment within the heat pump than within your average gas boiler. Other issues are awareness. Uh, if you go to an installer, um, they may have unless they're a heat pump installer um you know within the industry they're still uh, uh may not have any awareness of heat pumps may not be able to advise what is the best heat pump to use and as a building owner you may know not know what questions to ask about when you're thinking about installing a heat pump uh, and it's important to try and get good advice um, similar to the early days of solar uh, if you get bad advice, it might be oversized, it might be more expensive, might be more expensive to run. Um, so you need to try to make sure that you you get the best advice, really. Um, noise can be an issue, particularly with larger commercial units, uh, more than residential, but it is something to, to think about. And uh, grid capacity in the longer term with the rollout of heat pumps to levels we talked about, we need to work increasingly uh, um, in terms of Plymouth City Council does, with um, organisations like Western Power to uh, to ensure there's enough grid capacity, um, and uh, you know obviously that that's something that's is less of a concern to a domestic customer, but the government needs to support this sector either through incentives or fiscal measures to try to roll out heat pumps. Um, it's currently winding up the renewable heat incentive scheme that's come to an end, which used to support heat pumps and biomass and solar. 
and it's proposing a new scheme called the Green Heat Funds from April next year, which may help. We've yet to see the details, uh, which is, I think they're, th they're thinking on the lines of a straight capital grant. Um, but we've yet to see how that materialises. Also, with the, what, the changes in the electricity market that's worth, uh, may have an impact uh, called flexibility markets, where if you buy electricity at different time of day or time of, uh, of, of the week or of the year, you may pay, be able to pay less for it. Uh, there's an example that works at the, at the moment called Octopus Energy, have a tariff called the Agility that you know any of you can probably sign up to. So if you use electricity off peak, then you pay far less for it. In fact, in some cases, you might actually get paid to use electricity if there's surplus uh, electricity being generated through wind farms or, or solar uh, installations, and there's not enough demand to use that at a particular time. So there are things that may uh, help to, um, to, to actually uh, uh, promote the rollout of heat pumps in longer term in terms of the economics in particular. There are clear benefits um, in terms of safety, Gas boilers need to be inspected every year um, in terms of uh, the safe running. Um, gas can be problematic. Gas pipe work, particularly in, in flats and so on, can be problematic in terms of safety um, and, and give a higher fire risk. And of course, air quality. Uh, we talked about heat pumps have no flues uh, and not giving off any NOx emissions. Um, so uh, obviously there has been quite a lot of talk about air quality and concerns about air quality at the current time, as well, of course, carbon benefits. So that's um, a little bit of an overview. And I'll just hand over to Dan to talk about perhaps the role that organisations like PEC could play, uh, the role that they could play within uh, helping this rollout. Dan, do you want to... Uh, Oh, thank you very much, John. Um, so I work for Plymouth Energy Community, and I think Plymouth Energy Community have done a few of these talks before, but uh, just for those of you who may not be aware who we are, uh, Plymouth Energy Community is a community benefit society and our charitable trust, um, so two sides of the business, um, which works on reducing carbon uh, in Plymouth. It works to help people tackle fuel poverty. Um, and we look to add more renewable generation in the city. So, but it does it all on that, that local level, so in the Plymouth locality. Um, and the idea of doing it in this way as a non-profit is so the benefits stay with the people of Plymouth. So if we look at some of the renewable energy side, um, local people have been able to invest in some of those projects and they get a return on that investment. And we're not sort of paying companies like, say, EDF or NPower and stuff where the money is disappearing out of Plymouth. So it's, it's a much more holistic way of approaching energy and it's a decentralised energy system. Um, not the only solution, of course, to the sort of climate emergency, but a very good one locally for Plymouth. Um, and in terms of this project, working with John and Plymouth City Council, we've sort of taken the approach of, well, what's the role of, we, we know we need to decarbonise heat, as John's sort of put forward there. Um, we know some of the technologies that we're going to, we need to do it. We also know we're not there yet, um, but there's a lot, to, a lot of work to come up. So what's our role in, in all this? Um, and we kind of come up with a few areas. And uh, fortunately, some of them coincide with a couple of the questions in the chat. One of them is around sort of providing that independent independent advice. So, you know, we want to skill up internally. We've used this Some People project to do that. Um, so, so our energy advisors who go into homes, they talk to people about their energy bills. They talk to them about how they could retrofit bits of their homes. So they could put in draft proofing, they could improve insulation, et cetera. Um, what if we add to their arsenal, the fact that they can advise on, on heat pumps as well. Um, you know, it, it's very hard, I think, as as a resident or a homeowner to look at your property and say, yeah, well, I could definitely get a heat pump or not. Um, you know, John's outlined a few of the issues there, but you know, how airtight is the property? What's the sort of thermal properties of that property? And you know, the, the balance between cost of a heat pump and the efficiency of a heat pump are um, sort of very, <laughs> it's slightly complicated. And you know, we don't want 
we can't realistically expect every single resident to go and get some detailed modeling done on their house. You know, it costs a few thousand pounds and that's, it's not going to happen. So there needs to be an independent advisor of some sort. So PET can fill that role. Um, and also coming back to one of the questions in there, the checklist that, that John puts up on the slide, we will be putting together a kind of a, a portfolio of documents, including that checklist um, from this project to, to share with anyone, um, anyone and everyone. So we'll put that on our website. Um, equally, I think we could probably send that out via email to the attendees on this after this session. Um, and that's just a very helpful tool to sort of do a self-assessment, really, you know, similar to some walkthrough energy audits that people might do. Um, so there's definitely a role there for us to yeah, offer that advice. And that advice goes beyond just talking to the homeowner, but it also needs to ensure there's a good supply chain. Um, if any of you have in the past year or two looked at getting a heat pump or looked at getting solar PV, any of the Green Homes Grant stuff, you may be aware there's significant pressure on the supply chain. Um, the timeframes um, due partly to a short grant um, timeframe are quite uh, <laughs> challenging. Um, and you know, getting hold of that equipment in a short space of time, it has to be shipped maybe from Europe, so there's complexities there as well. Um, so how can we, as a community energy group, also talk to the supply chain, under their, understand their concerns and help them? Uh, and by helping them, understanding who's good and bad, um, or you know, what, what the strengths and weaknesses are of those organisations, we can start to pair people up and we can say, look, have you checked out this company or this company? Um, and indeed, there's some of our, our own programmes that PEC are delivering around uh, the Green Homes Grant, along with Plymouth City Council, whereby, you know, there will be installers who've been procured. So they've gone through a, a process, uh, sort of validated that they're, they're good and they'll do a good job. So there's definitely a role there. Um, in term, and working with the supply chain, I think is key. You know, that's, it's not just a community energy group responsibility. They need to work with us, so installers, uh, surveyors, Plymouth City Council, if we're looking locally, you know, there's, there's some responsibility on them to make sure that this all comes together uh, instead of being slightly bit part. Um, and the other area which we've investigated through this project is looking at new community business models. Um, so you may be aware that Plymouth Energy Community has put solar on rooftops and in fact many other community energy groups have as well um, and they, the process is Plymouth Energy Community raise funding sometimes through community shares which has been done a few times now. Um, they pay for the installation, they own and operate the, the site for a period of about 20 years and they sell the energy back to the site and that's how the money comes back. There's no, no capital cost for the site. There's an income, there's a return for investors, um, and PEC has a, a long-term asset. We've looked at something similar for heat pumps um, because we understand that, you know, that the capital cost of heat pumps is high. Um, it's kind of very similar to electric vehicles in that sense that, you know, there's plenty of benefits there, the carbon reduction's there, and technically it can be done, but that capital cost does put people off. And there's questions around equality there as well. You know, is, is this something for the rich because they can move first? Um, so we looked at, can we potentially invest in these heat pumps on a residential or commercial scale um, in a similar way to how we have with solar? And we sell the heat back, hopefully at no more than what they currently pay for gas and, or, or oil or LPG or anything else. Um, and we can get the money back that way. And it's uh, less pressure on the homeowner. We reduce carbon emissions and we're offering something to the, to the community. I think, as John, John outlined, that is a very challenging business case at the moment because of the cost of electricity versus gas. But it is something we are working on. And there are instances where it, it does work, um, probably more so on commercial level at the moment. But, yeah, there's a lot of talk from government around changing the dynamic between electricity and gas prices, uh, particularly about sharing out the, the taxes, the environmental taxes you get on your energy bill if you see a breakdown, there'll be things such as a climate change levy, for example, um, which you'll get on your electricity bill, but not necessarily on your, your gas bill. So it's about sharing out those costs and balancing things. So there's an incentive to decarbonize heat beyond just the environmental benefits, but financially it, it makes some sense as well. So uh, I think, you know, coming back as well to that advice part, you know, we can offer some advice in that area as well. Like 
you know, what were the motives for a resident um, to switch to a heat pump? Because you know, if it's environmental, then yeah, then there's probably uh, a great benefit there. But if the reason for somebody wanting to do it is financial, well, you know, that needs to be looked at more closely and it can be a trickier, uh, trickier one to win over. Um, so yeah, I think very much the sort of role of community energy is in that space of advice, facilitating those relationships with the supply chain, and then potentially, you know, in the not too distant future, developing those business models further. Um, but I would say, you know, we've, we've run a couple of consultations and stuff on this, but very happy to hear from people on what you think PEC can do in the future. Like, have we, have we got that about right? Or are there additional things that you as a resident of Plymouth or you as a, a homeowner anywhere um, would like to see um, that we could potentially uh, provide? Um, so I think that's, uh, yeah, that's my, my quick overview of, of PEC's role in this and the role of community energy. But um, that takes us probably on to questions, Owen.